Dear Naren, at first I want to thank for the opportunity to give a talk on neuroendoscopy. It's a great pleasure to make a contribution to your project. So I want to talk about tips and tricks in neuroendoscopy based on our experience we gathered in the past 20 years. First I want to talk about the endoscope design. There are two different basic designs of endoscopes. One is a channel scope where you have multiple small channels for the introduction of your instruments. And there are also space scopes like the GARP scope, which is not a separate working channel, but can use the whole space of the outer endoscopic sheath, which gives the possibility to remove big pieces of tumor. And so in some instances this is of advantage. But both systems have disadvantages and advantages, so our idea was to make a combination of both. So we designed, together with Karl Storz, a new endoscope called Lotta Ventriculoscopic System. We have two different diameters. One is a standard Lotta, one is a little Lotta. But the basic design is the same. Each ventriculoscope consists of an endoscope, the endoscopic sheath and a troca which is inserted into the sheath and used for the introduction of the sheath into the cyst or ventricular system. The outer diameter of the Lotta ventriculoscope is 6.1 mm. It contains a 1.7 mm rod lens. It's a Hopkins 2.3, a 6 degree optics which provides a very very uh, good image quality, especially if it's connected to an HD camera. We have a main working channel with a diameter of 2.9 mm and we have two side channels of 1.6 mm diameter which can be used for irrigation or for the introduction of a second instrument. The sheet had an outer diameter of 6.8 mm. It has a 14 cm working lens with lens markings which gives you control how deep you have inverted, you have inserted your instrument into the a cranial cavity. For me the endoscopic sheath is very important. Many people don't like to have a sheath and they use simply a peel away. But for me it's very important because I use the sheath for example during hemostasis or also to use it like a retractor to keep other structures away. This is a small video showing the application of the scope. This was in a fenestration of um, arachnoid cysts within the uh, carbon septipillucidae. And you see now the sheath keeps away the brain tissue and I have only the arachnoid membrane which I can cut directly working within the sheath. So the sheath gives me a working space and also it protects the surrounding brain tissue. That's why I like to have this sheath. The Lotta scope has the same design the outer diameter of the lotoscope is 3.6 mm. It has a rod lens of 1.2 mm and has a 1.6 mm working channel and two side channels with a diameter of 1 mm. The outer diameter of the troca is 4.5 mm and therefore we can use this lotter system in newborns, premature newborns, or also in adults which have a small foramen of Monroe. Here's a comparison of the diameter and you see the little lotter really is much smaller but is very effective also in most of the procedures. And if you compare the image quality of the lotter and the little lotter ventriculoscopes, you see of course the quality in the lotter scope is a little bit better because the diameter of the lens is larger, is 1.7 mm compared to the little lotter where we have an endoscope diameter of 1.2 mm. But nevertheless, both systems provide an optical quality which are sufficient to do all the endoscopic procedures. There are different kinds of endoscopes included, grasping forceps, biopsy forceps, scissors and the deck forceps which we prefer for endoscopic serpenticulostomy. The instruments have a lens marking on the shaft, you see it here, and if you introduce the instrument to the um, entry port and the marking is just in front of the entry port you see that the instrument tip is at the tip of the scope so this prevents unintentionally 
to deepen uh, insertion of the instruments into the system. And you have a click line instrument where you can turn the shaft of the instrument without the need to turn the whole handle, which gives you more economic feeling during the surgery. Hemostasis can be achieved with a forceps or with a bipolar rod. Usually we prefer the bipolar rod for hemostasis and this is really effective. So this is one example of an arterial hemorrhage which I had during the resection of an arachnoid cyst close to the fox. And you see I cut a small branch of the artery and immediately you have a red out. And then of course you simply stay in space. You should not move the endoscope at this point because you can damage some structures, especially when you are within the ventricular system. Then forced irrigation is initiated. And as soon as you have a glimpse of the wall of the cavity, I move the endoscope together with the sheath to the bleeding point. And then I try to bring the endoscopic sheath as close as possible to the bleeding point. And then I go a little bit back with my endoscope into the sheath. So I create an artificial sheath, uh, I create an artificial space within the sheath of the endoscope. Then I take the bipolar rod to compress the vessel simply to have an anatomical orientation. You see, with this forced irrigation, you can clear the view because it's just in front of the endoscope tip. Then you see here is a small perforator which was cut. And then after identification, I again compress the small perforators because I do not want to coagulate also the main vessel, but just the small side branch. And here you see now the margin of, this, of the sheath. So I create an artificial space within the sheath. That is very important to clear the view because if you have a large cavity, you cannot achieve a good view. And then the coagulation is done and hemostasis is achieved. So if there is some hemorrhage, I try to go very close with my sheath because the small space within the sheath can be cleared from the bloody CSF. If you have a hemorrhage in the lateral ventricular system, you cannot clear the whole ventricular system. This will take a long time. And this again shows how important the sheath is during certain procedures. For irrigation, we have an off-label use of an artro pump. Officially, this cannot be recommended because the pressure can go up to uh, 200 millimeter mercury, which can be a problem. But if you take care and you have the pressure in the ventricle about 10 to 20 millimeter mercury, it's a very nice tool to have a controlled irrigation. It is volume controlled and it also pressure controlled. We use that mainly for tumor resections when we expect prolonged hemorrhage. For cutting we use uh, the guillotine knife. The guillotine knife is an instrument where you bring a blade down to the foot plate and you can cut membranes without the risk of cutting into vessels with, which run under the foot plate. This is one example. You see this are regular scissors. I try to cut an arachnoid membrane which is located above an artery. And of course there is a risk that I puncture the artery and cut directly to the artery. And now the difference with the guillotine knife is you go under the membrane, you elevate the membrane, you can look and make sure there's no vessel trapped within the foot plate and then we can cut directly over the artery without any risk to damage this artery. And we have used the guillotine knife a couple of cases for septum perforations and arachnoid fenestration. You see the vessel here down and we think it's really a safe tool to get uh, this membranes cut which are located above neurovascular structures. The only disadvantage is that the blade should be a little bit sharper but for technical reasons obviously it's not possible to make it more sharp. We have also a flexible biopsy forceps that is used for bimanual dissection. This bimanual working is important in cholecystis resection or some arachnoid resections and you see the major instrument usually in scissors is introduced via the main channel and via the side channel this flexible grasping forceps is introduced and this allows you a kind of bimanual dissection which we have with microsurgery of course it's not the same because it's a very coaxial introduction of the instrument but nevertheless 
it's uh, sometimes very useful. For example, you see here, this is an arachnoid cyst. After opening the cyst, it collapsed, fall down to the fornix and to the vein, and now the cyst wall is elevated with the grasping forceps, and, and then we can cut in a very safe way without the risk of damaging the fornix or the vein here. So one short video shows you the resection of a colloid cyst and how to use the bimanual dissection. At first the cyst is mobilized into the lateral ventricle and you see here is a pedicle. And now if you leave the cyst falling down you have no control of the pedicle. That's why we take the flexible grasping forceps. We elevate the cyst a little bit and then we have access to the pedicle. We can introduce the bipolar rod from the, via the main channel and also scissors. So I can cut the pedicle without pulling. Sometimes you see people simply pull on the cyst, but then usually you get a lot of heme, uh, venous hemorrhage. That's why it's much safer that you have a good access to the pedicle and then you are able to remove the whole cyst. Another important thing, in my opinion, is to have a reliable holding device. I know that many people don't like to have a holding arm, <clears throat> but they have an assistant who is holding the endoscope. If you are an experienced team and you have, <clears throat> you have experience with guiding of the endoscope, that's, that's fine. But if you are alone and you have only a resident with you, I think it's much safer that you have an endoscopic holding arm. And we use the Mitaka arm. It's called the point setter. It's a pneumatic system. You simply press this golden button and then it's very, uh, very flexible, very easy to move. I think it's the best system on the market. All other systems which I tested were too rigid. But this is really a very nice tool which can be used for ventriculoscopy. And we drape this with a sterile cover before using it. And this is our, our technique. With the left hand we guide the endoscope and with the right hand you simply control the depths of your instruments. Your navigation can easily be adapted to the system, which is important for planning the approach in cystic lesions, if you have narrow ventricles, or if you do not expect any landmarks in the cavity where you're going in. The first, the endoscopic sheath is introduced by navigational guidance. And then, because the dynamic reference frame is fixed to the sheath, I have always the neural navigational orientation. It doesn't matter which endoscope is introduced in the system. And this is our setup. The monitors are in front of you. So you don't need to turn your head. We have one screen with the endoscopic image, and we have the other screen with navigation data, or sometimes simply with MRI or CT data. Another view in our OR. There are two more in, uh, endoscopes. These are used for inspection. We have very small 2 mm endoscopes and we have also a 3.3 mm endoscope. These are used for diagnostic purposes to inspect the ventricular system. We have 0 degree, 30 degree and 45 degree.